I'll admit, Southland Tales is a very confusing film. It was so ahead of its time when it premiered in Cannes, and it still is. However, due to the general poor reviews the film received upon release, it hasn't really gained a huge cult following. I'm a huge Richard Kelly fan. In 2001, he directed the cult classic Donnie Darko. I watched it when I was 12, and the film changed my life. Honestly, it is what got me into movies and the reason I want to work with film. And Southland Tales even appeared on Empire's list of worst movies of all time. Their main reason was that it's impossible to understand, even on multiple viewings. Totally wrong, yes, this film takes a lot of thinking to understand, and maybe that's not what you expect with such a mainstream ensemble, but it really is. It tells the story of an action star stricken with amnesia, who meets up with a porn star who is developing her own reality TV product, and a policeman who holds the key to a vast conspiracy. This is the IMDb description, and it really is completely impossible to describe what this movie is about in one sentence, because it's really about everything. There are so many hidden messages in the movie that you really have to dig deep to get it. The movie was released together with three graphic novels that are prequels and tells the first three chapters of the story, obviously. Southland Tales, the movie, contains the last three chapters, 4, 5 and 6. It might seem very odd to release a movie like this, considering far away from everybody would read the graphic novels, but I completely understand. The genius Richard Kelly wanted to create an extraordinary experience, and he did. Ever since I watched Southland Tales for the first time, I have been so fascinated with it. I barely understood it, but something about the mess was just so beautiful. After reading the graphic novels and analyzing the movie in depth, I have finally come to a conclusion of what the movie really is about. And that is what I want to share with you guys. The film sort of contains a summary of the three graphic novels in the first 10 minutes, but this only in the theatrical and DVD cut. The original can cut, which ran at almost 3 hours, barely contained any explanation to the previous events, which was why critics found it so confusing. Richard Kelly wanted to approach the project as something that was in development, but wasn't really allowed to, which is definitely why it was panned. I'll admit, the can cut is almost impossible to understand if you have no knowledge of the prequel saga, but it is absolutely brilliant if you have. So with all this information in mind, I am now going to tell you the story of how it all came crashing down, as Justin Timberlake's character pilot Abilene says in the narrative. To clarify this, I will try to go through the movie in chronological order and then explain what happened in the graphic novels as well as what purpose this actually serves as a whole. Okay, here we go. In Southland Tales, World War III has begun as described. The national security is at a very high level and people are required to provide visas in order to travel between states. If one citizen is chosen for the army, they have no choice and have to fight in the war. This is actually what we briefly see in the beginning here. Pilot Abilene, played by Justin Timberlake, is a very successful actor who one day is recruited by the government to join the army. He has to fight in Iraq and there he meets Ronald Tamner, played by Sean William Scott. Ronald and Abilene wants to leave Iraq and go back to America, so they are linked to an experiment which I will explain later. During this experiment, in combat, Ronald accidentally throws a grenade which hits Abilene and hurts him badly. Throughout the movie, Ronald actually believes that Abilene is dead because it was the last moment they shared together. It is a little hard to notice the similarities between the drawings and the actors, but we see these events here in the intro taking place. Basically both of them come home, but take much different paths. Ronald becomes the subject of a conspiracy by a neo-Marxist. He and his now supposedly twin brother, Roland, are sort of kidnapped by them and they together plan to win the election using their help. Ronald is suffering from amnesia and Roland is sleeping all day under the influence of fluid karma. The neo-Marxist tells Ronald that his brother is involved in a conspiracy and has to hide, which is why he is always with him. They are of course lying, but I will get back to the continuation of this chapter later. It is 2008 and a new election is about to take place. The Republican party had a power, but their biggest enemy are the neo-Marxists, who are sort of planning on rigging the election in order to win. They kidnap Boxer Santeros, a famous actor played by Dwayne Johnson with strong associations to the Republican Party, being married to the daughter of Elliot Frost, the vice president. He's discovered in Nevada, 
where they also find a dead body in a car who has apparently been through a terrible accident. Truyer, a company owned by Baron von Vespihallen that had developed a new energy source, Fluid Karma, took care of the body later. It is revealed in the graphic novels that the company has heavy ties to the neo-Marxists, although this is barely referenced in the film. Remember this, because this will be important later. For now, I will tell you about the ultimate plan that sort of set up the basics for the movie, although this is something that isn't really explained in the narrative. Bakker Zantaro suffers amnesia, and the neo-Marxists decide to take heavy advantage of this. He's taken to a strip club in Nevada where he encounters Krista Now, a famous porn star who is trying to sort of start a revolution by becoming her own brand. She has her TV show, energy drink and much more. Krista has written a screenplay called The Power. Boxer and Krista decide to develop the script together. Meanwhile, the neo-Marxist, who she is connected to, also take advantage of him by basically making him donating a lot of money to them. To cross the border between Nevada and California, Boxer and Krista make up a deal together with the driver that basically lets them cross it without anybody noticing, as that would reveal their plan. The neo-Marxists have set up two things now with Boxer. First off, there are photos of him rocking the cock with Krista now, as they say, and the neo-Marxists are planning to leak them if they don't get anything from the Republicans in return. They have also fooled Boxer Santeros into thinking that he has written the screenplay on his own, which is later uploaded to his own website. He also becomes obsessed with this and decides to research his role of an LA cop. And this is where Ronald Tavner comes in, and to explain this properly, I need to retell the story of him a little. As Ronald is suffering from amnesia like I earlier explained, he is fooled by the neo-Marxists into thinking that his brother was a cop who is involved in a conspiracy, and now they want him to imitate him, and they also tell him that Roland is a racist cop. This all because two very famous icons of the neo-Marxists, who are also making music, Dream and Die in Element, wants to set up a staged double murder committed by a racist cop, captured on tape by movie star with ties to the Republican Party. I suppose this would show what a fucked up society they live in, and if this would be a Republican who captured the reality, it would make them look quite bad. So Ronald takes his approach and pretends that he's a racist cop for Bakr Santeros so that he can research his role. It will be a lot easier to explain the rest of the story if I just go through what happens with this. Ronald picks up Boxer and they stop at this house where two people are having a loud fight. Dream and Dying Element. Of course set up so that it looks like some sort of disturbance crime. However, just when they arrive, Bart Brookman, another cop, arrives at the scene and actually insists on following them inside. Boxer captures all of this on tape, and when Dream notices Bart, she takes the moment to talk shit about the Republicans, but is instantly and unexpectedly shot by him, and so is Dying Element. This is super unexpected, and it was meant to be a staged murder, but in fact, these two celebrities were killed in the roles they were playing at the moment. So this all goes to hell, sort of, and Bart even grabs the camera and tells both Boxer and Ronald to get out of there and Ronald starts thinking about who he really is. Now it's time to explain the power of the Republican Party. As the election 2008 will only be decided by one state, California, the Republicans are trying to secure it and this is also why the neo-Marxists are so crazy. Partly, there's also another reason I'll get to later. The so-called brainchild for the Republican Party is the US ident. They control everything in the United States, inspiring everyone in a sort of George Orwell's 1984 style. Cameras are everywhere and every citizen is being spied on. When something seems suspicious, they have the right to send someone to clean up the mess. US ident have full control over the internet as well and no one is safe because of them. This is showcased many times in the film. Why are the US ident doing this from the start, spying on everyone? Well, mostly because of World War III and the Republican Party are trying to do everything to avoid terrorists. However, it quickly develops into something else because of the neo-Marxists. Kenny Chan, an employee of the US ident, is secretly a part of the neo-Marxists. However, Star Love Unloved sort of betrays him, another employee of the US ident, by placing an audio recorder in his code, I suppose. Naname frost listens to everything and decides to invade the house that Kenny pays a visit to. All of them, but Kenny and Roland leaves before a police troop invades the house. Roland barely manages to escape due to him being heavily influenced by the fluid karma drug, and this is where we come to the fluid karma stage of the film. The term fluid karma is used to refer to two things in the movie. 
First off, it refers to an organic compound that a trier company discovered while drilling off the coast to Israel, which exists under the Earth's mantle and circles the world like a serpent. Second, fluid karma is the name used by Trier for the hydroelectric energy field produced by their Utopia tile generators. As the movie explains, the compound is being used by the Baron to power his energy plants, hence the energy field produced is named after it. The compound also works with drug, which comes in several forms with different effects, as mentioned by Pilot Abilene, Green, you dream, blue, in an hour you feel new, and you can forget about mellow yellow or agent orange, cause hey, I'm giving you blood red. The movie and prequel saga focus a lot on the blood red version of the drug, which gives the person using the drug ability to see or bleed into the past, and with repeated use, the future. Food karma also makes a telepathy possible between those that are using it. As the movie suggests, the Baron conducted secret experiments headed by Simon Theory with soldiers in Iraq. The product was named Serpentine Dream Theory, which aimed to use the telepathic effect of the drug as an advantage for the soldiers on the battlefield. Like I said, two of the soldiers that participated in the experiment were Ronald Towner and Pilot Abilene. The Baron used the drug to keep everyone under control and on a leash, but did not realize that each person under the influence of fluid karma can communicate with one another. Fox and Terrence becomes obsessed with getting into his new character, Jericho Kane, for his new film, The Power, that, like I explained earlier, he hasn't even written. But due to his amnesia, the neo Marxist makes him believe that he actually did, and because of this, he feels more encouraged. In that film, the main character, Jericho Kane, is an LAPD cop who isn't who he seems. He sees things, mainly that the Earth is slowing down by 0 .0000006 miles per hour each day, which is disrupting the chemical equilibrium in the human brain. After the failed stage double murder, Starlove Unloved, who has read the screenplay, confirms that it foretells the story of the destruction, and everything that is in it is fully correct. So what causes this global meltdown? Fluid karma. By digging down to the Earth's mantle, the Earth starts rotating a lot slower and this causes a lot of people to act stupid, which they do in Southland Tales. That is why many of the conversations might seem very odd, but there is a much deeper meaning with this that I'll get to later. The fact that Batra Santeris and Kristen now screenplay Four Tales to Destruction is also sort of confirmed by the neo-Marxists in the comic book shop earlier in the movie. At this point, I basically explained the first hour of the film, and most information you have hopefully picked up here will help you understand the other hour and 20 minutes. Before we can continue, however, let me explain what exactly Fluid Karma does to the characters in the film. I mean, the drug, of course. First off, in the 14th minute of the film, when a roller coaster Desperado shows up, this is a reference to the graphic novels, because Box and Terrace is having visions about this roller coaster in an Indian connected to it. And Justin Timberlake's famous dance sequence, well, it is connected to the drug as well. Think about this, he is surrounded by women who all represent Marilyn Monroe. Anyone sees connection here? So let's move on to what happens after the failed stage double murder. Like previously explained, Star of Unloved calls Bakker and tells him that he's right about everything, but she can't say more because they are listening. Starla plays the role of the female character in the power here, as she calls boxer Jericho King. After which we get the first clear insight on how Trier Company partly collaborates with the Republican Party. Boxer calls one of Bobby Frost's agents and is later driven to the meeting by members of the Trier Company and Republicans. The meeting basically becomes a scene of betrayal as secrets are revealed and not much happens there really. But what happens to Bart Brookman and his tape? First off, it turns out that his arrival was also staged by this girl from the neo-Marxists and they in fact want the tape so that they can do more blackmailing. To not reveal the plans to Roland or Ronald Taverner, both are under the influence of heavy fluid karma. The ice cream man injects the identical twin brother and he's seen earlier in the film talking to this neo-Marxist. There is a character introduced at this point in the can cut who didn't really make it into the final version although she's visible in the background in one scene. General Tina MacArthur. Her scenes further explains how Trier Company and the US Navy are working together on the experiment I mentioned. Now it's time to go to the last chapter, Wave of Mutilation. This takes place during the last day before the world ends. 
The assassination of Dion and Dream is reported as an accident. Krista now pays a visit to the neo-Marxist house that we saw earlier in the film, there she accidentally picks up the VHS copy of the murderer, as she thinks it's a tape of her and Boxer making out. Bart Brookman and her lover then realizes this and loses it completely. Venice Beach then becomes a place of chaos when Boxer and Teros, now Jericho Kane, encounters Starla, now absolutely batshit crazy about the script. She tells him to go to the Mega Zeppelin, and there is the secret to the whole mystery. After she is shot by Pilot Abilene, Venice Beach as a whole is chaos because Chris and now also encounters Bart Brooklyn and Sarah as they are looking for the tape. However, both of them are shot by soldiers protecting the area. With that being said, Krista still has a tape of Bart Brookman killing Diane and Dream. Bart and Terrence is also kidnapped by the Neo-Marxists, once again here, and brought to the Mega Zeppelin. After Sara accidentally calls Ronald by his brother's name, he's all confused and decides to find his brother by the help of a recently army recruited man, Marty. During the night, the Mega Zeppelin launches and members of the Republican Party, a few Neo-Marxists and the Trier Company, are on board. Now this is where the twist for the whole story comes in, that might be predictable if you are familiar with the work of Richard Kelly. Park Center is led to an experiment room, there are three people from the Trio company are expecting him so that they can reveal the truth. A rift was discovered in the fourth dimension, located in the outskirts of Lake Need, Nevada, probably while looking for fluid karma. What happens if someone travels through the rift? They travel back in time. And that is what has happened to both Box and Terrace and Ronald Taverner. A duplicate of Box and Terrace was created once this happened. He traveled back 69 minutes in time. That duplicate is a dead body that is discovered in the beginning of Southland Tales. How exactly that happened is never explained, but the boxer we have been following is the one who traveled through the rift. The world is going to end with a handshake, and if two duplicates would come into immediate contact, the world would collapse. As understandable here, Roland and Ronald Tanner is in fact the same person. At this point, Ronald is just trying to find his partner and also has another flashback on when he accidentally killed pilot Abilene in Iraq as he believes, which he can't really forgive himself for. This is when a lot of material from the Revelation and the Bible starts coming in. Boxer realizes that this is the end of the world, just like his film character Jericho Kane does. Ronald eventually finds his brother inside an ice cream truck and they shake hands and this is what is going to end the world. Both are under the influence of fluid karma, therefore they can communicate. Roland talks to Pilot Abilene who forgives him for the friendly fire. When Ronald tells Roland I forgive you, it is actually Pilot Abilene talking. Martin blows out the Mega Zeppelin, killing everyone on board because that was his purpose on Earth. I will get to this very soon. And finally, the world ends with a handshake. That is Southland Tales in a nutshell. Basically the whole plot explained. It's not much of an analysis, but every question you've ever had about the movie has been answered. Probably. Except maybe the I'm a pimp and pimps don't commit suicide, which basically means that cool guys don't commit suicide. I mean pimp is basically a metaphor for soldiers in this case. And for those claiming that Southland Tales makes no sense, well with this explanation it hopefully does. Now it's time to go to the why part of this. What's up with this real crazy story? It is a retelling of the book of Revelation. Boxer Santeros is the protector of the Messiah. Roland Taverner is Messiah. He forgives sins which he does in the very end. Martin Kefauer, who helps Taverner finding his duplicate, is the angel of death that rides on the horse, which in this case is the ice cream truck. Dream and Dine are murder and the two people to witness this are Boxer and Ronald. Kristen now is the one who foretells the future and is therefore the word of God or the Apostle John. She foretold the apocalypse. Madeleine Frost and Teros, the wife of Boxer, is the pregnant woman from Revelation 12 and 13. Bobby Frost is a beast from the same revelations. Baron von Westphalen, owner of the Trier Company, is obviously the Antichrist. He set this all up, created fluid karma, betrayed people, used fluid karma to keep everybody in control and more, which he eventually failed with and who is Pilot Abilene. The White Horseman, with his rifle, Post being his horse and his rifle his bow. Shown with white shirt flecked with blood as the Revelation describes the White Horseman as wearing a white robe flecked with blood. This makes a lot of sense but it wouldn't really matter for me if this is the actual point of the story because I love the screenplay itself so much. And Southland Tales predicted the future damn right. 
When it came out, I completely understand why people thought it was ridiculous, but as time has passed and we are now in 2016, 10 years after the film had its premiere in Cannes, this film is more realistic than ever. So what are some of the themes? Well, let's get back to a few things I discussed, like the whole theme of people going crazy. Obviously, the movie is partly a satire of the American political system, and some of it is shockingly realistic. I guess my main point is that people who have no involvement in things play as leaders nowadays. Especially celebrities who think they know so much and act as politicians. This might be completely wrong, and in Southland Tales, these celebrities turn out to be not as dumb as you thought, but for example, Look at trying to figure it out on your own. Then we got all of these scenes of cameras actually zooming out from television screens. This stands for the fact that all our information comes from media rather than real life and this is how we look at the world. From this small scope, you can find a lot more of these hidden messages. Trust me, they are hidden everywhere when you really think about it. Speaking of which, did anybody think of the massive product placement in this film? It is actually hidden of enormous consequences around the world that it has yet to recover from. Well, that's it guys, an explanation of the movie Southland Tales and also the central themes it has.